My name is Nicola and you're watching Singularity FM, the place where we interview the future. If you guys enjoy this podcast, you can show your support by either writing a review on iTunes or by becoming a patron via interviewthefuture.com. Today, my guest on the show is former Google design ethicist Tristan Harris. Tristan is the person who coined the time well spent concept, most recently adopted, at least nominally, by Apple, Google and Facebook. He is also a co-founder of the Center for Humane Technology and has been called the closest thing Silicon Valley has to a, a conscience. So, Tristan Harris, welcome to Singularity FM. Thanks for having me, Nic- Nic- Nicola. Fantastic. This interview has been a year in the making since our <laughs> brief meetup during full uh, camp. Uh, That's right. So thank you for taking the time again. Let's just right, jump right in. So I introduce you in, another, in a number of uh, sort of very impressive statements, if you will. But if I were to ask you simply to describe who Tristan Harris is in your own words to someone who's never heard of you and what you do, how do you do that? Um, well, you know, now we have this nonprofit, the Center for Humane Technology, where we work on catalyzing systems change. So the system of incentives, design and practices um, and uh, policy that create the current sort of experience that technology has on society, which is human downgrading. That while we've been upgrading the machines, we've been downgrading humans. And this is due to an extractive attention economy, much like we live in an extractive energy economy that externalizes climate change, which is catastrophic. Okay. I'm going to wait, uh, gonna wait for the audio me... to go back. Could you, could, can you hear me all right? Or there's the siren. Yeah, sure I that. hear you perfectly well. Okay. Actually, this gives me a little break here because my question was, who is Tristan Harris? Not what you do. Hmm. Who is Tristan Harris, the person, in one or two sentences? Well, that is always a hard question to answer, isn't it? Um, I think that uh, each of us don't know that answer in a spiritual sense, um, at a very deep level. Um, I care a lot about where the world is going, and I'm very concerned about all the trend lines and see it as um, my duty, my karma to be as helpful as I can in a situation of pretty dire circumstances. And um, that's what I feel on a daily basis. Uh, It comes out of concern, seeing trend lines, being inside of private rooms where, you know, you assume that there are adults in the room making decisions about these bigger issues, and then finding out there's not that many adults. And fear, frankly, about where that leads us if we don't actually really get on top of it. So that's that's where I'm coming from. Yes, yes. I understand where you're coming from, but I'm trying to get a glimpse of who you are. And I know that's a super hard question indeed, but it kind of is the foundation of what we do. And I think it helps us if we are very clear about it, generally speaking. Uh, but that's, of course, only a, a single point of view. So let's talk a little bit about the journey of you, you kind of told us what you do and where you're at at the moment, but let's talk a little bit about the journey of becoming who you are today. Where did you start? Which were the major sort of turning points and how did you end up doing what you do and founding the, the Center for Humane Technology and so on? Well, relating both to who I am and also the journey, um, one thing I, I do mention is I, I was a magician as a kid. Uh, and that's important because it really leads you to see human nature in a very different way fundamentally than most human social primates walking around on planet Earth. You see humans as this incredibly easy to deceive species. <laughs> um, instead of looking at our strengths, you know, you could be talking to an astrophysicist that helped build the rocket that got us to the moon. And guess what? Their mind still works in the same predictable set of vulnerabilities, weaknesses, biases, and constraints. Um, Our memory is plus or minus seven plus or minus two things. 
you know, misdirection works, causality is easy to hack. Um, there's just a set of very consistent rules that are universal to all human minds. And that's the core thing that gives me my worldview. That comes also from a personal um, exploration of my own mind and seeing the ways through some other practices that I've done in my life, even just personal and spiritual ones, of seeing the ways that beliefs take hold and how much they, they stretch across the full canvas of our experience of reality and distort what's coming in through the looking glass into um, you know, false beliefs. Even something as simple as, oh, I'm late. So we started this interview 10 minutes late. I feel bad. Oh, Nicola hates me. You know, these kinds of things, right? <laughs> and you know, your, your, your mind conjures these beliefs. And when it believes them, it, your experience as a human animal with this canvas filling up the full movie screen is totalizing. There's a totalizing experience where my phenomenology is filled with I'm 10 minutes late to this interview. So in general, I feel like my perspective and my concern about technology comes from this sort of full stack uh, interior exploration of the ways that um, the, we experience reality. Uh, and that's what I'm, oops, my theory keeps coming up for some reason, and I'm gonna make sure it doesn't do that. Um, so anyway, that's where my, my experience comes from. Very cool. So I like that you bring up your sort of magician background because that's all about directing or even misdirecting or manipulating attention, if you will, isn't it? Yes. I mean, the core of magic, if, if there's anything, is the power of where attention goes. You know, it's funny, I did a, um, a retreat once uh, of pickpocketing, hypnosis, and magic together in Bali. It was actually one of the, my favorite experiences in life. Um, it was with a magician. It wasn't with some kind of Bali street pickpockets or something like that. But pickpocketing is also another exploration of attention. And, um, you know, people think you're, you know, you're, you're quickly like rushing in to get it while they're not looking. And it's, it's not like that at all. You're actually with them. You're present with them. You're talking to them. You're making eye contact with them. And, and you're even like, you know, with them while you're exploring, well, what's in your left pocket? Let's look at it together. And it's all happening in this very, you, know, you feel as if you're right there with it. And it's, sorry, my Siri keeps coming up. Um, you feel as if you're right there with it, and um, it it, uh, it it's not it's not like that. But magic is the study of the misdirection of attention. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Nick doesn't hate you at all. I was just a tiny disappointed that like we lost ten minutes, but that there's no hate there. It's just a little tiny disappointment, and we make best <laughs> with what we've got. So moving on. So you're a magician as a kid, but. Tell me about your story or your journey from then becoming a tech entrepreneur, being bought by Google, then becoming Google's uh, design ethicist, and then eventually, from my understanding, you resigned to be able to do what you're doing now. So tell me about that journey. Yeah, well, so, um, you know, at Stanford, I studied computer science, and uh, I actually did sort of pretty typical computer science, human-computer interaction, symbolic systems mixed in a lot of linguistics, cognitive science, uh, but really just how do computers influence and relate to human minds. Did internships at Apple, worked with Jimmy Wales at Wikia, Wikipedia spinoff, and then started my own technology company that got bought by Google um, as a talent acquisition of our team. And um, the core insights that I gained from Stanford later came from this thing called the Persuasive Technology Lab that uh, was a lab at Stanford uh, run by Professor B.J. Fogg, who studied social psychology. He was basically looking at every way that people's attitudes, beliefs, behaviors, and habits could be influenced in general. And the idea is, you know, it's helpful to know these things because you could help people have the habits that they want to have. Like they want to go to the gym, they want to floss, they want to live the life they want to live. Um, they want to be more peaceful. And he's a great professor and he taught all these students about persuasive technology. Uh, and we, we apply those insights into how do you design technology. So once we know what is persuasive to the human mind, to the human nervous system, to the habit formation system, how do you design technology that actually utilizes all those, those insights? This is an uncomfortable thing for a lot of people to think about, especially people who probably believe in sort of singularitarian, you know, future uh, techno-utopian ideas, because we think we're this great species, we've sent people to the moon, we've done amazing things, the idea that we're not in control or that we can be persuaded 
is something that people resist. I've, I've flipped on that like a decade ago. So I have a hard time empathizing with people who actually find that hard to believe. <laughs> but I think all you have to do is look at magic to realize how universal those human weaknesses and blind spots really are. And this is where it shows up later in things like fake news and addiction and slot machine techniques and casinos, which we'll get into. Um, they're all related to one continuum, which is the universal hackability of human nature. And, you know, in, in that class at Stanford, I was partners with the founders of Instagram, Mike Krieger. We actually use persuasive technology to build something that would cheer each other up. It was called Send the Sunshine. Uh, it was an app that basically looked at when some, someone in your social network was in a zip code where if you ping the weather APIs and you see, oh, they have five days of bad weather in a row, someone might have seasonal affective depression disorder. And so we said, oh, well, what if we texted your friend who we know has been in a good zip code with positive weather for the last six days and text them, hey, would you take a photo of the sunshine and send it to your friend, Mike, who's had bad weather? And so that was an example of using persuasive technology for good. But then what I saw when I landed at Google, I saw, this is back in 2012, most of what people were doing in technology was basically how do I manipulate your attention with more notifications, more infinite scroll, more, you know, whatever will keep, will keep you. And it became this arms race for who can go lower into the human brainstem, who can crawl down to your deeper, more vulnerable, soft underbelly of your brain and of your nervous system to, to get results from you. In the same way that in the sort of, um, you know, the industrial revolution, we wanted to get more productivity and more work out of people in the consumerist late stage capitalism sort of version of an engagement economy, we want to get more behavior, desirable behavior out of you, which means we need to make you more and more predictable. And um, I, at Google, I made a presentation that basically ended up going viral that was raising the alarm bells about this persuasive technology economy um, and how the attention economy was finite and how we as Google were hosting in the palm of our hands, how 2 billion people's attention were steered. And when people think about ethics, they think about trolley problems like, oh, like, you know, the, the self-driving car is going to kill one person, it's going to kill five people, and you could pull a lever and it'll kill one instead of five, but then how does it, you know, those are the ethical problems we think about. No one thinks about the trolley problems of attention, that the news feed's going down this way and two billion people are going to receive this kind of fake news and this kind of ranking algorithm. Or you could put your hand on a lever as a design ethicist or a Facebook newsfeed engineer, you pull that lever and then a billion, two billion people go down a different train track and they experience a different newsfeed, a different ranking. And these are the questions that are at the root of where technology has been causing serious harms and serious issues in society is by basically controlling and shaping 2 billion people's attention, it's become this mass psychological mind control uh, influence machine. And that might sound um, over aggressive to say that, but once we get into the facts, I think people will agree with why that's an accurate diagnosis. Well, those are some of the questions that we've been asking on my blog since 2009. So uh, I don't think there'll be that much new there, but let me ask you this, because you mentioned the persuasive technology lab at Stanford. Did you guys take any, and I know some people have called your class the inf infamous Facebook and Instagram class. Uh, did you guys ever study ethics there? Yeah, BJ actually does have a whole component that's on ethics, which is important that people know. A lot of people mischaracterize this lab as a diabolical training ground for evil manipulators and, um, you know, social engineers. And there are certainly some of the people who've gone on to go to the dark side. Um, but it's important that BJ as the professor of the class is cleared from, um, at least directly trying to instigate that kind of outcome. Um, he's been, he warned the FTC back about the ethics of persuasive technology in the late 1990s. There was a class at the end of my, um, uh, semester uh, taking that class, uh, one whole segment that was on the future of ethics of persuasive technology. And it was actually in that class that I first freaked out about the concept because we were saying, well, what if in the future you had a perfect persuasive profile of each human social primate living on earth? You had, based on their ID, you said, okay, here's Nicola. And Nicola, based on his experience, his language, his friends, his, the faces of his friends, the kinds of experiences he had in life, he's particularly vulnerable to, let's say, appeals to authority. If I say that the Brookings Institution said this thing is true, Harvard University, he's the kind of person who really respects 
uh, reputable authoritative institutions. So we'll use that. Or maybe he has this predilection for women that look a certain way. I was actually just reading a paper. Um, I mean, we're all, if you're a man, then you probably have this vulnerability universally. But I was just reading a paper about how um, there's now deep fakes being used uh, on LinkedIn um, profiles to generate pictures of semi-attractive you know, women who could be the average of you know, women that you might be connected to on Facebook. And you could generate faces that might seem perfectly and unfamiliarly or un, um, what's the word? Um, um, perfectly like fine you don't even, for your own liking. For your own liking or for your, but not, not in the sexual sense, in the sort of trustworthy sense. And sort, of the, and sort of get you to do what they want you to do. Correct. And if, you know, I, I actually know, I've actually seen many um, people that I know who've actually become, they, they accept friends invitations uh, on Facebook or LinkedIn. Well, my wife is the perfect women. example of a woman like that. She's been doing it for 16 years with great success, <laughs> yes. but it's only one and she's right. very well intentioned. So I, I'm totally <laughs> cool with that one. <laughs> and so what happens when you have Iran, Russia, North Korea, and China realizing that they can do this yeah. and that can create Tinder profiles that do the same thing and they can create Grindr profiles that do the same thing and they can get into um, your news feeds and send you messages and they can even send you a message with a text of a photo of you in the photo with someone else and they're in the photo too and they say, don't you remember when we had that, that party three years ago? Wasn't it fun? It was so fun to meet you. And you're like, oh, I guess this photo must be real. And then it's deep faked and suddenly they're hacking your trust mechanisms. This is fundamentally an existential and civilizational moment for a transition in our okay, species. This is really that, critical people get. I understand that, but but I want to walk before a little more before we get to that actual problem. And and, and so I, I was just trying to figure out what's the ethics that you studied in, in, in the persuasive technology lab, because you said you studied it. Someone who doesn't know anything about the curriculum would say, well, I don't know what you guys studied there, but you ended up creating Facebook or that lab ended up giving birth to Facebook like buttons and Instagram, uh, some of the arguably most damaging and, and, and perhaps undermining or manipulating technologies that we have created. And in a way, that same lab would be the dream of, of someone like Stalin, Goebbels or Kim Jong-un. Yep. So I'm trying to figure out, okay, he's a great guy. By the way, I'm going to try to get BJ on my podcast because his work mm. is, is uh, fundamental in so many ways. But yep. where's that ethics coming in? What kind of ethics did you study specifically? You know, I mean, it wasn't um, incredibly detailed. It's not like we had a whole semester on this. Um, it was just posing the questions. I mean, a lot of the teaching style of that class was, imagine you had this perfect persuasive profile. What's wrong with this? Because some people in the class, even back then, were saying, oh, wouldn't this be great? You could have perfect marketing and advertising and perfectly target a message to these people. And you could give people even more of what they want. But there's something that's fundamentally wrong about that. And BJ didn't say, this is what's wrong about that, or here's a paper saying this is what's wrong about that. He just had students feel uncomfortable, and you know, which naturally emerges if you have a conscience. Now, a lot of people in that class, you know, BJ is not in control of that. A lot of people didn't have a conscience, and they um, would, would find, I mean, there's basically like a small handful of psychological excuses that the mind makes that says, these are just, you know, people who want, they're just lazy, they would have eaten the sugar anyway, they would have believed the conspiracy theories no matter what we did, we're just giving them what they want, we can't control people. Um, you know, and this is really just not taking responsibility from the fact that you as a technologist are now building the social and prosthetic infrastructure that is the extension of our daily thoughts and choice making. And, you know, I, I think that there needs to be a far greater education I don't see it as like studying Kant and Jeremy Bentham and utilitarianism and that kind of reasoning. I think it's getting more of a I humanist think kind of ethics. I think Stoicism and Platonism and, and uh, ancient Greek and Roman philosophy would be dead on useful, actually. And mm -hmm. I think that also when you put that lab in the context of Google and you have the president of Stanford on Google's board of directors and you have Stanford being the birthplace of Google and you have... Google and other companies funding the research of that lab, it is absolutely unsurprising that the result has been what the result has been. And with 
very little stress on ethics and perhaps the exact opposite of ethics, <laughs> unethics. <laughs> yeah. Right? So, so still going back to my, my original question, this is the perfect lap if you're Goebbels, if you're Stalin. Yeah. I grew up in a communist country as a child and I have memories of that and this would have been perfect for those guys. Yeah. So, so I don't see how that's a good thing for a good, a good lab to have, a good research to have, personally. Yeah. Well, I and think I don't see we... how the results have been any, any surprising at all or could have been different. I agree with you. And there are those who, you know, be careful what technology you make, because even if your desire is to use it for good, the people who use it for bad will generally outcompete those who are using it for good. So instead of saying, well, because one of the classic ethical excuses that Silicon Valley makes is, you know, well, we wanted to build it first because we know that we, you know, we needed to show people the world that this problem existed. And now we want people in ethicists to now it's their problem to solve this, but we needed to make sure people knew about it. So we built it anyway. And this is the strategy that even OpenAI took with generating and announcing that they could generate deep fake sentences and paragraphs of fake news that sound perfectly legitimate, as legitimate as anything else. So now machines can generate perfect fake news. And they're saying, well, we wanted to show people that it was possible. And now it's up to ethicists to figure this thing out. It's like, we can't do this. This is a dumb idea. There are information and moral hazards that as soon as you release this information, it's like, it's like handing highly enriched uranium out to the world and saying, these are exponential technologies. So I agree. And I think that there is a... The fundamental thing that's dangerous right now is that we're decentralizing increasingly exponential and uncontrollable tech. And, you know, it's one thing if, you know, per Nick Bostrom, you're picking balls out of an urn and you're discovering new insights about science or new insights about technology and you get, he calls it the vulnerable world hypothesis, that what if instead of picking a nuclear bomb insight, you know, out of the realm of physics, and it being the case that you needed this hugely expensive project and a Manhattan project and all that, what if it was the case that just by smashing two forks together, you could actually create an atomic bomb explosion? Like, let's just say science and nature worked out that way. That would be a decentralized version of exponential tech where anyone had that power and capacity. And that's, that's what would be increasingly dangerous. The problem with technology today is that it, as it's scaling exponentially up, we're decentralizing exponential power into more and more especially less and less wise hands um, and with really bad moral and ethical reasoning. And that's what's so dangerous, especially when you consider the combinatorics of maybe you can protect against CRISPR and gene editing, but as soon as you add that or combine that with some other exponential tech that's developing in parallel, the combinatorics of all that are way too many to capture. And that's why we actually really need a new infrastructure to manage the exponential tech that we're creating. I think the problem is a little bit different perhaps. The problem is that perhaps you're investing hundreds of millions of dollars of creating the most powerful technology, and yet you're not investing in wisdom as per how to apply that technology. In other words, that's a, an afterthought, which is why you have this kind of a passive, passive, passing sort of nominal you know, recognition of time well spent in Facebook or of ethics in that lab, per se, in my view, it seems. And so all the current problems, whether they're global warming, whether there's environmental destruction, pollution, nuclear weapons, is basically our technological power far outpacing our wisdom as per how best to control and apply it. And that's at its core an ethical problem, right? That's the same problem that the Stoics were talking about two and a half thousand years ago. That's why I say that should have been material, like very relevant in my opinion, because everyone knew that you could become the, the emperor of Rome, but if you didn't have the training of a Marcus Aurelius, chances are it's going to, that power is going to undermine your character and you may end up being a Caligula. Yep. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, for, Center for Humane Technology, we use as our sort of mission statement um, that the fundamental problem of humanity, as E.O. Wilson said from sociobiology, is that we have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. In other words, we have the power of gods without the wisdom, love, and prudence of gods. And that's just paraphrasing Barbara Marx Hubbard. I did not invent that. 
Um, and that is the fundamental thing that we're gaining too much power while having not having the wisdom to wield it. Worse is that we point exponential tech per this new attention ecosystem. We're pointing all these engagement maximizing machines, YouTube's recommendation system, Facebook's newsfeed, which are both supercomputers pointed at people's brains, downgrading the quality of your wisdom. So you're actually getting even worse than not sufficient wisdom. You're actually getting worsening sense making, worsening ethics, while you're getting increasing exponential tech. Exactly. That's, it's that's like giving trend children. That that's existential. It's like giving children fire to play with because they exactly. never got the maturity to learn the safety of using fire in, in, in a best way possible or useful and productive way. And chances are they burn themselves and the world around it in that process. That's right. And that's why I think the conversations about free speech are so naive because you say free speech. If the founding fathers knew that you were going to let someone who is a Goebbels like Hitler like character out compete and get recommended 15 billion times on YouTube, um, you know, as totally not making moral equivalents, but you know, Alex Jones from InfoWars was recommended 15 billion times by YouTube. Think about that. Like that's more than the combined traffic of New York Times, Guardian, Washington Post, etc. Yeah. You know, without any of the responsibility. So imagine if the New York Times, Washington Post, Guardian, BBC all published that the Sandy Hook, you know, school shooting was all done by crisis actors. Something ridiculous like that that reached even more number of people. That's what we're doing when we're saying we're exponentiating free speech. We're just exponentiating free lives. So our moral ideas are vastly inadequate to a new wiring diagram in which it's not about freedom of speech. It's about your freedom of speech is not the same as freedom of reach. And we, we need a whole new set of moral, you know, moral concepts. We've been talking about a new sort of, you know, federalist, conven fe you know, fe uh, federalist convention um, to uh, think about these things in the, in the digital age, because it's fundamentally, we're in this totally different landscape and we don't have moral ideas that even match um, the, the problems. We're going back to, to outdated concepts that are not matched the situation we're in in the 21st century. So what is your biggest fear, Tristan? Um, climate change. Uh, no, I, I'm, my biggest fear around this work, especially, um, is that the attention where 2 billion people's attention goes is the substrate for every other consequence that happens in the world. It's the basis for culture, it's the basis for politics, it's the basis for elections, it's the basis for people's own life choices and well-being. Because if you manipulate 100 million human teenage social animals into being addicted to getting attention from other people, and you cause mass mental health issues and self-esteem issues and insecurity, and which teen suicide and depression has gone up by like two and a half X in the last, you know, um, I think it's like six years. Um, I'm worried that our ability to focus attention and construct shared agendas around our existential issues is being destroyed. That our information ecology, our sense-making ecology is being debased by technology that it was innocuously maximizing whatever kept our nervous system hooked. So why is that a bad thing or why should people be worried about it? Because if you can't make sense of the world and you have so as the world gets more and more complex in not just an arbitrary way, but in ways that we know are existentially threatening like climate change, it's never been more important to have accurate information about what, where the problem is, what the problem is and what to do about it than now. And if people can't agree on what is true because technology shreds their truth apart into a billion different Truman shows, which is what it's doing, that is catastrophic to our ability to coordinate and take action. More than ever, we need the ability to see reality in similar and shared ways or semi-reliable communal sense-making as my friend Eric Weinstein says. Uh, and we need the ability to construct shared agendas about what we want to do about it. Mm -hmm. Right now, even people in technology who are trying to reform it are, are competing with each other and yelling at each other, which is a product of the outrage economy that technology amplifies. So that even those who are working to try to solve these big problems are yelling at each other 
instead of agreeing with each other and trying to construct a shared agenda. So, you know, you could look at this as we're screwed and left to our own devices, we are. The interesting thing is that human, the human mind is the only intelligence that we know that's alive right now that has the capacity to see that it's its own limits and its own weaknesses and its own vulnerabilities and that this is happening to it. And upon seeing that, to do something different. Like imagine if gazelles or lions created climate change. And like, because you exponentiate the instincts of like lions. So imagine like sharks, right? So you have a shark with shark instincts and you know, millions of years of evolution say that when I smell blood over there in the ocean, I just go right, right over there for it. But if you exponentiate the, the, the choice making of a shark, so now you say add a million mile long, you know, fish drift net to the, to the tip of the nose of a shark, it smells, you know, blood over there and it sweeps through the ocean and exponentiates its massively inadequate uh, evolutionary instincts. That's what, that's what technology is doing for us. We have these, you know, moral outrage and, um, you know, uh, fear, aggression, et cetera, and, and confirmation bias. And now we're exponentiating the weakest parts of ourselves and we're debasing the social fabric. Now, again, sharks, if they were in that situation, don't have the consciousness to see that that's what they're doing to their own environment because they don't actually have a brain that lets them plan out the forecasting. And these are the consequences of that. Let me do simulated analysis. Like we do, we're the only ones that can see, Oh, this is what's happening to us. It's hijacking my lower level instinct. So this is kind of like the grand challenge, like the grand question. It's almost a joke or a cosmic joke. Like we're the only species that could both be in this situation and have the unique capacity to see that it's happening and to put our hand on a steering wheel and do something different, which is what we absolutely need to do. Like anybody who thinks we can keep doing what we're doing is insane <laughs> and we have to change. And so now is the time perhaps you can share with us in terms of changing that sort of paradigm. How does the Center for Humane Technology in general, and especially your concept of human downgrading in particular, fit within that change you're trying to cause? Well, so the reason that, that you know, we got criticized for this, because people think, oh my gosh, do they really think that by sitting in rooms and coming up with words on white papers uh, and, and drawing on posters, different language, that that'll solve problems. And of course, we don't think that words solve problems by themselves. But the thing we noticed was, if you ask most people right now, what is the problem that we are trying to solve in the tech industry? What you will get back as responses are a cacophony of grievances, scandals, and turf wars that say, no, privacy is the most important thing. No, antitrust is the most important thing. No, addiction is the most important thing. No, team mental health is, the, no, 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 wait, it's deep fakes and Cambridge Analytica. And it's like, you know, you're getting hurricane fake news, hurricane Cambridge Analytica, hurricane deep fakes, hurricane tech addiction. And no one's asking the question, why are we getting all these hurricanes? And so what we need to realize is that we're getting all of these problems from one common generator function, which is technology that is misaligned with human weaknesses and is designed to extract out of those weaknesses uh, profit through extracting attention and behavior. And that, that causes mass human downgrading because as this technology gets stronger and more and more powerful at sucking and scooping that attention out of your hollowing out your brainstem to, to upgrade the profits of the machines and reinvest into bigger computing power to get even stronger at predicting and out manipu manipulating you, it's downgrading you. It's, it's, so there's two things going on. Um, you know, there's two ways to um, predict humans behavior. One is you actually take a, a human being, you know, we're, we're really complex and intelligent and creative and we're super expressive and you know, all that stuff. But one way to make us more predictable, we're going to predict what we're going to do, this little blue doll in my hand, is to simplify us, to make us act out of impulses, anxiety, and fear. Once I get you acting out of anxiety and fear, you're far more predictable. So it's much easier to predict what you're going to do. And then I can manipulate you if I can predict what you're going to do. The second way is to build a bigger supercomputer that can predict the space of possible things you might do next. And technology is doing both of those things, which is why we call it human downgrading. It is both hijacking the lower level nervous system, your dopaminergic system, your fear, your anxiety, your outrage, your self-esteem, your narcissism. 
and simplifying your, your behavior, your values is getting the hundred million teenagers to be mostly concerned with how much attention they're getting from other people because that's a weakness. So it simplifies us, upgrades the machines, but then it also in upgrading the machines builds better and better predictive models of even on the most complex scale, what you might do next and how to manipulate you there. And then you get this kind of vanishing point where the space of human expression of what we might do next is increasingly collapsed into kind of a vanishing point where we become increasingly predictable. And we're not predictable in the sense of we're more predictably going to solve our big existential problems like climate change. We're becoming increasingly predictable in our being downgraded in our downgrading of our attention spans, our critical thinking, our shared truth, our civility, our democracy, our mental health. So we're actually going the opposite direction. So that's why we call human downgrading an existential threat. And we, we, we needed a name for this interconnected set of problems because otherwise, if we're trying to do solutions and we build a lever, and when we pull that you know, solution, like let's say it's a policy or design solution meant to solve fake news. Okay, great, we have this fake news lever. Let's pull on that lever as hard as we can if you're not also covering the interrelated issues of addiction, isolation, deep fakes, you're, and we don't have time to build enough levers, we're going to be playing infinite whack-a-mole. So we have to see that all these issues are connected, that all of them happen as a continuum of hacking different human weaknesses. So let me, let me like really pause and, and, and map this out for people because it's really critical to understand. When I say human weaknesses, the first like Marshall Islands of technology hacking human weaknesses, that we, we use this graph, by the way, of while everyone is watching out in the sort of the singularity community for when is technology going to outpace human strength? So here's technological progress going up, 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 up. And then there's this line when it crosses human intelligence, human IQ, and that's boom, it takes our jobs, the singularity. Oh my God. Everyone's like looking out for when that's going to happen. It's going to be 10 years, it's going to be three years. And there's this much earlier point where technology doesn't have to cross human strengths. It just has to cross human weaknesses. And that's the magician's insight. Once I hack your weaknesses, that's all I need to take control and outmaneuver you. And this is so hard for people to get and understand. The first Marshall Islands of technology hacking human weaknesses and crossing that threshold was our experience of distraction or information overload. Oh, like I can't think of those tabs. I don't know which tab was I just in. I, I opened my email, but I forgot why. I was in that tab, but I don't know what I'm doing. I opened a Facebook, I don't know why. Our mind's getting overloaded. That was the first hacking of human weaknesses that we got distraction. Okay, then you get um, hacking the human weakness for brevity and short attention spans because short things work better in the attention economy than long complex things. So you end up saying shorter and shorter things about more and more complex topics that, increase, that automatically creates polarization because people can't, you can't say something that actually encapsulates the complexity. You can only say something simple, which automatically makes some people agree with you, other people disagree with you. That feeds into other dynamics. So you get all of these different problems of information overload, addiction, isolation, polarization, outrageification, narcissism. These are not separate issues. They're all on a continuum of hacking human weaknesses. When it hacks our cognitive limits, you've got information overload. When it hacks our dopamine system, slot machine rewards, you get addiction and compulsive use. When it hacks our narcissism and self-esteem and social validation, you get um, influencer culture, people needing attention from other people. When it hacks the foundations at the very end, when it ha hacks the foundations of your trust and what you believe to be familiar and true and trustworthy, you get deep fakes. And all of those problems are on one continuum, which is the continuum of human weaknesses until you get full checkmate of human nature. And that's it. So this is an existential issue that we have to actually protect human nature. We have to protect the limits of human weaknesses. And this should not be controversial because it's not like you walk into a bank that doesn't have encryption and say, oh, no, we shouldn't protect the bank. We should just like, let it be unencrypted. It's like, no, we're walking around in brains that have zero-day vulnerabilities where you know, we need McAfee and Norton and, and cognitive defense mechanisms that help protect and empower and strengthen uh, human nature instead of downgrading it. So in your view, then, is it the case that currently Silicon Valley is sort of slowly helping us and saving us or destroying us and and maybe because you called it an existential threat it's currently an existential threat and right now so far as they continue downgrading humans which they continue to do they not doing not when i say they i don't mean that there's an agent of evil engineers who study at the persuasive technology lab who want this to happen Let's be really clear, they are trapped in a business model 
of maximizing screen time and engagement, which means, which is really just extracting as much human behavior and making humans as predictable as possible. And so long as, so long as they're in that business model, you will continue to get these problems because they are not treating you and your sovereignty or your agency with dignity. They want to treat you as a domesticatable human animal in the same way we treat cows to be most extract, extraction worthy for their milk and their dairy. And we breed cows to be best for that. We are converting the rich, full expression of humans into this new class of domesticated humans who are most extractable for their attention. That, that's why we have 40 second attention spans. It's our average focus time on screens. That's why that um, people are addicted to getting attention from other people because a domesticated human in the attention economy is one that wants most attention from other people. So that is an existential threat because all of the consequences of human downgrading add up to decreasing our capacity in the face of increasingly complex threats. That's what we have to fix. Right. And that's what Marcus Aurelius was talking about, by the way, in terms of the temptations of being a living God on earth, which is the, what the Roman emperor figure was. Uh, and right. in speaking about the fact that when your power grows to the fact that you can literally decide between life and death for people in a, in, in, at a whim, if you will, in a, in, a, in a split second, who is right, and you're the living judge and the living sort of executional and law and all of that, if you don't accompany that process with an equal parallel growth in, in your character, your moral code and your ethics, you're, you're kind of doomed not only to destroy others, but most likely to even destroy yourself, which kind of brings me back to the Stanford lab. You know, whoever was it that presumed that you could even ethically steer two and a half billion people's mind? Isn't that like the most self-serving presumption? Especially if you're funded by Google, who's already doing that. So it's like starting with the presumption, we can do this ethically. What if we can't? Yeah. Right? What, no, what if a... you're not supposed to to steer, I mean, two and a half billion? Should anyone be given the power to steer two billion people's thoughts? Right. It's the question you're asking. So is it is it is that not an oxymoron is what I'm what I'm saying? Ethically steer two two and a half billion people. So steering and ethical are those not like sort of contradictory terms? Um what I hear in your question is a question about whether or not it's ethical to build technology. This is actually, I think, if you look at the Unabomber's writings, Ted Kaczynski, um I actually haven't read these writings, but I've been told um, from people summarizing them to me that he was so concerned with because he was actually doing forecasting and saying, what happens when you can exponentiate anyone's interests with asymmetric power over other people? That's the definition of technology is I can exponentiate consequences so that my choice can impact a greater and greater, more efficient number of people, more efficient number of consequences without being guided by an exponentiation of considerations. How many other balance sheets of conscious agents in the environment and public health and other people and conscious beings can I be aware of in exponentiating? So if I have the ability to act and, and influence the consequences for all of these other constituencies without having any closed loop understanding of how that'll affect you. So think about empathy, which is really what we're talking about. If I say something, we're on a Zoom call right now, I can see your face. If I say something that hurt you, I would see it in your face. And my nervous system <laughs> makes me automatically feel that it would hurt you. You just said I would something see... that hurt me, actually. And I'll tell you in a oh, second. Oh, what did I why. say? So you totally misidentified or misdefined technology. And that's a very common occurrence in Silicon Valley. No one actually knows. How would, how would, how would you define technology? Well, it's not how I define technology. It's, it's what technology was defined. Technology consists in two Greek words, techne and logos. Techne means an art, a craft, a skill, or a means by which a thing is accomplished. Logos means words, utterance, saying, an outward expression of an inner thought. So literally the term technology means a discourse or a conversation or words about the way that things are gained. So literally technology from its very original concept and meaning 
is merely a means to an end. It is never an end in itself, and it's always only concerned with the how, not the why and the what. And unfortunately, <laughs> what really hurt me is like I believe, and I, 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 what the part that hurt me was that I didn't think you would do that too. Is that in Silicon Valley we are kind of obsessed with the how, and then we bring in the why or the what way as an afterthought. So we put the cart in front of the horse and we worship the cart, and and we say this is the best. And we start looking for the best usages of the cart because, not because it's good in its own right, but because we have a cart and we have to find a way to apply it, to monetize it and to scale it. And you have the resulting problems with that kind of switching of the proper process, which originates from the poor misdefinition of technology, reverses the whole process and you end up, I believe, in the situation where we're at today. <laughs> but that's just, my kind of like opinion, which is why, by the way, when I was in 2011 going through Google, Facebook, Tesla, NASA, all those places, you know, a num uh, at the time, the, the, the thing in Google was Wi-Fi gate. I kept asking questions about Wi-Fi gate and people hated me for that and, and even like asked for me not to go anymore from my understanding because they're like, oh, it was... why would you do this? Why would you actually wire up a city with Wi-Fi owned by a private company with private incentives? No, no. The Wi-Fi gate was basically Google installing equipment to snoop on and identify people with Wi-Fi networks, sucking all the, the information. That oh, oh get. but the self-driving cars and their indexing exactly. uh, Wi-Fi. Get, yeah, get their uh, pa passwords, especially if they were, because at the time, most people's networks were unencrypted, right? And Google's answer was like, well, those are just like one car with a couple of, you know, misbehaving engineers. I was like, yeah, it happened in Germany, in Korea, in the United States. It sounds to me a lot more like than one car and a lot more than just a couple of engineers. Right. But let, let's let's get on topic because we kind of got digressed, but it's kind of on topic, really, because I'm just trying to see. Like, I love what you do. I love your work and, and I love what you stand for. And yet I'm struggling to see if, if that's progress, what we're seeing right now. Tell me, what was the what, response? What, of what your, do you mean? What is, what is it, progress, what we're seeing in what? what? In the formation of, the, uh, of, of your not-for-profit organization and... Well, think of it like the world is on fire. The orcs are coming from basically 10 different directions. 95% of the forest is probably going to burn down. Democracy, populism, the conspiracy theories. We are trying to salvage the basic sense-making infrastructure. So but we you don't burned it. The entire college. Your classmates burned it. <laughs> they created Instagram Well, be careful with the word you here. I mean, I, I did not build these yeah, products. Yeah, no, I'm, In fact, I'm not I've been trying to name. Yeah, I'm not yeah. speaking of you individually. I'm speaking of you as, 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 as Silicon Valley, right? And I'm speaking of you as, as like a bunch of former employees of Google, right? Or Facebook. And that's great. Maybe now you can save it. I hope so. I really hope so. That's why I'm rooting for you. Well, but let, let's understand. actually cover this for a second because I think this comes up a lot. There's this kind of like, oh, the people who destroyed everything are now trying to save it and isn't it nice and convenient for them now and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think that anybody who is directly involved in creating these systems need to put their money, their resources, their time, their energy where their mouth is and actually work to reverse this problem. There is not that many people who are doing that. Um, Roger McNamee, who was Zuckerberg's mentor, who yeah. partnered up with me, you know, back in, in 2017, and we found, found ourselves help, you know, getting the first Senate hearings happening on the, on the Russian investigation and the tech platforms, because people had not actually done that exploration, ended up advising policymakers. I mean, we are putting, I have dedicated my life to this. And I say this without ego, I just mean, this is such a massive problem. This should, there should be an army of people who are trying to devote their time, energy, and full resources to this. I mean, I didn't profit from this. I didn't actually build these systems. I didn't well, actually- Robert McNamee did profit and maybe he's supporting you with a million bucks, but he made a billion from burning it, figuratively speaking. And th that's the example of many people there who are supporting you and I'm supporting you too. And you didn't profit for it, but they profited 
exponentially and now they're trying to change it linearly. So my concern is that you can't have it both ways. On the one hand, you're invested in, in Facebook, you're making a killing on it. On the other hand, you're gonna start or support a not-for-profit with a fraction of your Facebook profit to counterbalance the damage done by Facebook. Well, this is a, the, the inequality in capitalism in general and philanthropy. If you look at the winner take all book, Anand, um, whatever his name was that wrote that book, um, you know, you, you can't, in general, funding, I, I like your, the way you're framing it. I mean, you cannot solve problems with linear, you can't have linear solutions to exponential problems. Simply said. Especially if and, your upside, personally, as an investor, comes from the exponential damage or growth the or the stock, mar the stock of, of whatever it is. Uh, agreed. And, but this is, this is a true system that, this is a true thing that's true across the system, whether it's climate change. I mean, why are not the people at the tops of the exponential growing profits of, it's not quite exponential, but the people who've made lots of money uh, off of the energy, extractive energy economy that is putting civilization at risk, not putting exponential amounts of resources, especially towards the most vulnerable populations around the world, at, you know, and, and the most vulnerable nature, natural ecosystems, et cetera. That's the only way we're going to solve this, to balance out the balance sheet. Like, I, I love what you're saying. And I think, yeah. you know, we are trying to call those other technologists to bear, to, to step forward and to do that. And, you know, I share your concern. I, I've been working on this for seven years, and it's only in the last two years that anything's ever happened. The bad news of that is there's far fewer people who are in this position of ex-technologists calling these problems out and being honest and correct and not trying to sugarcoat it. Um, on the good news, there's far more today than there were a year and a half ago. I mean, yeah. if you ask me even two years ago when I met Chris Hughes, that he would, was, would he ever write an op-ed saying <laughs> we need to break up Facebook? Yeah. You know, when I met him and we've met several times, you know, that is not where a lot of us a lot of the other folks have been at, even yes. Roger McNamee, you know? Yes. And so the great news is that people are starting to come out. And by the way, people listening to this podcast, if they're inside of these companies and inside the tech industry. One of the things that's caused the most change is more and more people stepping forward. And yeah. you go from it being a minority to a majority because it's actually the silent majority. Increasingly, people are waking up to the structural harms of this problem and they don't want to be part of it. Do you want to go down in history as participating in the destruction of democracy and the civil, the civil order. I mean, is that where you want to stand? Is that where you want your kids to see you as? Is that, do you want to be able to answer their questions about climate change or what you did, what your participation in tech was? Where do you want your legacy to be if there is going to be a legacy? So that's why it's all hands on deck. I mean, this is a very existential moment. It's very easy to devote our lives to this at this point for me because this is very clear. Like either we solve this and, or, or we, we try to address it or we're definitely toast. Like it's so clear. So it's never been easier to dedicate your time and your life to try to be of service right now, if you see these problems honestly. Yeah, I get that completely. That's why I've been doing what I've been doing for free, everything that I've been doing now for 11 years. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's why my thesis on my blog has always been technology is not enough. It's necessary, it's not sufficient. And that's why when I was at SU and, and that was not a message, especially in 2011, was very, very unpopular message. It made me very, very unpopular. Very, very. I'm glad to hear you're promoting that message because you're right that in the singularity community, it's been a huge blind spot that people think, even still to this day, I meet people, some people who are way too high up in the tech industry to be saying this, that's saying, oh, we'll just innovate our way out of climate change. Like, oh, no, big, no big deal. We'll just have, we have nuclear, we have infinite energy, we're, we're going to be fine. And I'm like, where? What are you in touch with right now? Do you, you know, millions of species are dying. Like we're gonna have permafrost methane bombs, like climate migrations. Like this is such a serious problem. And on that, by the way, I mean, one of the things I'm actually most interested in is how could Silicon Valley bring its own resources and weight to bear on being the mass coordination infrastructure for adaptation, mitigation, restoration, um, reversal on climate. Um, I think that not that they can invent the solutions, but they're the sense making and choice making infrastructure for 2 billion people. And as people see the accelerating harms, you know, you know, when Gavin Newsom in California said after the wildfires that this is the new normal, this is the new normal. It's actually not the case. First of all, that's really hard to hear. But when you really take this in, you say, this isn't the new normal. This is the best that it will ever be hmm. right now. And so, so what do we do where the trend lines go? We, we need 
a this is a like World War Three level war footing. We need to be on war footing on changing the system, and anybody can participate in that. I think what most people don't know is that there are lots of people who see these structural problems and actually have some people have plans about how to fix it. But it, it's it's a big complicated process. A lot of people feel powerless because you have to start understanding so many different systems to know what does it mean to act in service right now. What what is enough? What is right action? So what is it? Well, in the case of technology, we need to make sure that we're protecting and repairing our our information ecology and our and our the quality of our sense making. This involves sort of a full stack climate change like effort where you we have to put pressure and and ultimately abandon this business model of treating humans as extractable resources, which leads to this downgrading which means getting off the advertising business model. And this is equivalent to getting off of fossil fuels. We're moving from an extractive era to a regenerative era. And we can do that. Like imagine a world where a year from now, Apple with iOS just basically boots out all of the attention maximizing products and says, we don't allow these business models because even if they don't immediately cause harm, as they get more competitive, they will cause harm. And we actually support these kinds of services. Imagine they rename the app store, the help center or the help store. And everything is just competing to help people with things in their lives. And you download things not because they get you using apps, but you download things because their entire um, basis for their offering is that they have creative new ways of helping people uh, get to real solutions in their real lives. And they're thinking creatively and they're actually competing on that basis. So imagine, you know, for someone who's single, instead of the apps competing to maximize how much time you're swiping, which is what they do now, and no one actually ends up meeting each other. And by the way, sex rates are down like 30% or something like that in the last couple of years. Um, imagine a world where uh, everything is competing to help you be in environments that tend to lead to fulfilling connection and relationships. It turns out that our human nervous systems are actually pretty darn good at this. If you put about 40 people over the course of a weekend or three or four days together in a private space, chemistry naturally forms. And right now, being in those spaces with 40 people over three or four days is one of the hardest things to do with a smartphone. It's actually almost impossible. Um, and that could be the opposite, though. We could actually make it so that applications are competing to make those kinds of naturally regenerative environments possible, which is the same thing, by the way, with climate change. So um, with climate change, a lot of the solutions... mechanisms in those uh, apps or... Because there's a reward so, mechanism that you go through very much in detail, how it currently works. How do correct. you reverse that? And that's basically the reward mechanism of the slot machines in, in Las Vegas. But how do you switch that paradigm, that mechanism? Because one of the things that really drove me nuts when I was at Singularity University was the fact that they kept saying everything is going to change. Nothing's ever going to be the same. Yet the overruling under, under uh, sort of uh, underlying paradigm was not something that they saw ever changing. In other words, it was easier for many people to foresee the end of the world by AI rather than the end of capitalism or a new paradigm or a new model in which those companies or technology would be created, right? So I was yeah. like, how can you change everything here and not change this thing here? But Well, this is like, uh, you know, um when Demis said to Elon, uh, you know, my, a will, my, my AI will follow you to the moon or follow you to Mars. Like, it's like, you know, I, I said this in my TED talk too. It's like, instead of building new, instead of trying to colonize new planets, we could fix the one that we're already on. Like our problems aren't going anywhere. Like in whatever utopianism that we somehow believe is gonna solve these problems is exactly the same. It's not like we discovered utopia, technical utopianism now. We've been saying the same kind of optimistic things for the last 10, 20, 50, I mean, forever. And it got us exactly to this point. So whatever moral and, and sort of other philosophical view that we've had has clearly been insufficient. And we need a totally different system that incentivizes different things, uh, which includes different economics. I mean, I think here's a radical idea. I mean, if you are a major technology platform that is controlling the global infrastructure, you should be a public benefit corporation. Like you should be incentivized to be serving the public interest. Well, Singularity um, University became a public benefit corporation with uh, one of the new investors being Boeing. Oh, I didn't realize that. Uh, yeah, $30 million. And the three largest private owners are Peter Diamandis, Rob Nail, and Boeing. 
and it became a public benefit corporation. Yep, some time ago, big scandal. I did a whole speech in Rotterdam about uh, the emperor has no clothes. Socrates deconstructs Singularity University. They tried to take down the video. They even called Google to try to take down my video because they figured out it's on my channel. Anyway, long story. Then I got banned, etc. But the point is that I don't see how that's helping. They are a benefit corporation. And in fact, they're worse than ever because before that they were a charity that were supposed to address humanity's grand challenges. Now they switched their motto from let's solve humanity's grand challenges to be exponential, which is like be a tool, be a means to an end, you know, forget. And, and the stress is on exponential, but the important part is of course, be being who you are, because if you have garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. Only now it will be exponential. Exponential so you, garbage. Yeah. Yes. So if you screw up the being part, it doesn't matter how good you are at the exponential part. And that's my concern here is that Silicon Valley is the best at being exponential, but they're right. but that's not what's worse at being. And then when whatever it is that they're taking exponential end up doing more damage than good. Exactly. Which is why what we really need is a, a philosophical and a wisdom and a compassion for revolution more than we need a technology revolution. Um, I just, I didn't mean public benefit and corporations since that magically solves the problems. We need something that marries daily action and interest with basically reversing the, the honest appraisal of the current state of affairs, which is catastrophic. And if that was the daily incentives, that's what we all did. I mean, that, that is what happens during wars is that everybody orients around not like let's maximize the economy, but everybody's going to work to make sure that we're serving, um, you know, our survival. Um, this is just a different kind of war. I mean, we say that, you know, the way for humanity to win the final war is to make peace with ourselves, to make peace with our own weaknesses, our own limits, our own denial, our own ostrich in the sand, not wanting to look at our real problems. We have to see that that's what we're doing. I mean, my most, one of you asked me, who am I and where did, where did my identity come from? One of my most profound influences was when I read this 600 page book on denial and how powerful denial is. And there's many different kinds of denial. You can deny that something's happening or you can have denial where you know that something's happening, but you deny the implications of what that means. There's many, many different kinds of denial and in seeing how bad we are as a track record, as a species, the Holocaust, et cetera, climate change, we are horrible at being in touch with reality, especially when it comes, when that harm and the risks come slowly. So again, if we make peace with the fact that that's our native functioning, we can actually change that. Meaning we can't change how you work. You can get in touch with and embrace how you work and collectively try to do something different. Um, Tristan, unfortunately, we're really running out of time and it flew so quickly. And I'm afraid I didn't do the best possible job to kind of have the best possible conversation, but perhaps it was different anyway than what you've done before. I don't know if it was good, different, but I did my best. Let me ask you the two last questions I always ask at the end. And first one, and they're very simple. First one is where can people find more about you and your work? Um, you can uh, go to humanetech.com is our website for the Center for Humane Technology, even though it's .com, we're actually a nonprofit, just we couldn't get the .org name. Um, follow me on Twitter uh, at Tristan Harris. Um, you know, we are trying to build a movement. Um, and we have a head of mobilization who's built multiple successful movements, trying to actually have people form relationships with other people who want to see this change happen and participate in working groups and dinners, facilitated dinners, policy, shareholder activism, media uh, informedness, guiding the conversation. Uh, venture capitalists funding the transition from extractive to regenerative humane technology. Um, that is the change we're trying to see. Ethics somewhere there, but I still don't hear it, my friend. Ethics is part of is part of that that transition. It involves different processes and different education. It's that it's more. It's a longer conversation about. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just theory. afraid that it always gets overlooked, and and even like, you're an engineer by education. All mm -hmm. your, most of your colleagues are engineers and therefore, uh, and I even watched an interview with Aza. I love the guy just as much as I love you. And by the way, I, I, I'm Socrates, so I don't give people the easiest time on my interview, but 
that doesn't mean that I'm not that's what you should do percent behind you and in support of everything I do so I want to make that very clear but on the other hand I watch how Aza was saying that when he created the infinite scroll how he he was blind for the longest time this would be perfect and how he went like basically proselytizing about it and all of that and that's like a typical engineering blind spot that's like Put it, that's what Facebook did. We, by definition, are good everywhere, all the time, everywhere in the world. And a philosopher would never presume that, actually, I think. So that's why I keep insisting on that. Let's do some ethics and basic ethics, like that you can apply to your day, every day, like stoic philosophy. Uh, and uh, Anyway, so. I, I always come to this work with, with with humility every day. In fact, I worry every day whether or not the actions that we even see as strategically highest leverage and, you know, I, any any kind of belief that you know what the right thing is is always dangerous, especially if you can exponentiate that and it affects lots of people, um, which goes to your point about exponentiation. The challenge we have is that to simultaneously recognize that we don't want people to have exponentiated power and also reckoning with the fact that that's where we are. So now that that's where we are, what are the wise actions to take? And it's kind of like chemotherapy. You know, right now you have Facebook that's leeching off of democracies around the world. You're trying to get the tumor off and you have to be both improving the quality of the people, let's say that we're working on fake news and polarization and mental health issues inside of Facebook because you want them to be empowered, but you want to kill the tumor while, we're saving, while saving the patient. And, and so we have to be really thoughtful and practical. And I think this is where the extreme sort of research community or like let's burn it all down you, you have to I'm, I'm with them on on sort of the the feelings behind that motivation and also i try to be really thoughtful about what are the actions that make sense given all that just like climate change like we, we we need a world where the oil companies as much as they do have power are actually in service of the transition everyone has a role to play um because the good news is that no one's getting out of this alive unless we all fix it so so we had a probably 70, 72 minute conversation or something like that. What is the most important message that you would like our viewers and listeners to take away from our conversation with you today? Because I pushed you in a number of directions. We didn't have a chance to really dig into it anywhere really deep. But what in your view is the, the most vital thing you want to carry across? Um, I want people to understand what's happening and going wrong with technology as a interconnected system of harms, that we don't have addiction or isolation happening separately from people believing in more conspiracy theories. There's a relationship between people being more isolated and being more vulnerable to conspiracy theories on YouTube that are maximized because of attention. There's a relationship between shorter attention spans and people, people only being able to say short, brief things about an increasingly complex world that leads to more polarization. So there's an interconnected system of harms that's equivalent to social climate change that's tilting the social fabric. I want people to talk about and understand what's going wrong with technology as a kind of social climate change. You can use our phrase human downgrading or not. What matters is just that we understand it as a system and that when we approach it from solutions, we approach it systematically. And the, the root cause of that is going to be fixing the business model of advertising. Um, and so long as everybody's on that page, we can actually work together to make that transition from an extractive attention economy based on advertising to something that's regenerative, humane, and per your words, ethical. So, And I could not agree more and support more your message. And by the way, I would recommend uh, my, to my audience to go check out your new podcast, which is fantastic. I listened to the first yes. episode and it was highly informative, very rewarding in terms of time well spent. I would argue it's one of the best 42 minutes or something like that that I've spent recently. Uh, so oh, fantastic. Guys, yes. go check, Please out. check that out. It's called uh, Your Undivided Attention, uh, which is actually meant specifically to engage with, it's actually the primary vehicle by which we hope to get the people who are both inside and outside Silicon Valley, including policymakers, to understand the issues, the invisible parts of human nature getting hacked, and then actually explore solutions together and to talk about them with other people and to host dinners and get form relationships around what would it mean you know, topic by topic to correct those misalignments. So your undivided attention, we'd love for people to tune in. Tristan Harris, thank you so much for spending so much time with us today. I really appreciate it. And I wish you good luck in your quest to fix technology. Thank you so much, Nicola. I really appreciate your questions.
If you guys enjoy this show, you can help me make it better in a couple of ways. You can go and write a review on iTunes, or you can simply make a donation. Thank <laughs> you.